For every McDonald's that you see in the world, there are four Adventist congregations. But this didn't happen by chance. We are now in over 200 countries and territories around the world. How could it be that a group of people, a small group at that, in the northeast of the United States, gave birth to a movement that continues to grow and expand to every territory on the planet? It didn't happen by chance. It happened through the sacrifice of many missionaries that have been sent for the last 150 years to every part of the world. I'm here with David Trim. Dr. David Trim is the head, the director of a very important department here at the General Conference, Statistics, Research, Archives, ASTR as we call it. David, welcome to ANN In Depth. Thank you, Sam. It's good to be with you. I assume that people imagine that the archives of the General Conference is in a basement somewhere in the building. Are they right? Yes, they're absolutely right. That's exactly where we are. And they're welcome to come and visit if they are around, I suppose. Uh, yes, they need to book in advance. We'll talk about how to do that in a minute. We have another podcast, David, called Mission 150. Yes. And the podcast is a celebration of the 150 years of the Adventist Church sending missionaries. And it's a podcast that is dedicated to the telling of stories that most people have never heard of before, of the sacrifice of our pioneers but the unknown ones. Tell me more about that. There are so many people who contributed to building up the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But when we tell the history, we usually only tell the stories of a handful of individuals. And that's partly because we simply don't remember. Uh, we've Our collective memory uh, is very faulty. And we like to think that we value our history, but actually, oftentimes we don't. Uh, and so there's, we've concentrated on just a handful of individuals, Ellen and James White, perhaps John and Andrews, Uriah Smith, a couple of others. And we ignore the many people who served heroically, people who served for 30, 40, 50 years in mission fields. When they came to go back to their homeland, it must have been a, a strange experience because their homeland was no longer their homeland. They'd spent most of their lives in mission fields, working for people who they loved and who they came to care for. Um, and so Mission 150 tries to tell some of those stories. It also tells the stories of people who died or and who suffered in order to build up the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As you said in your intro, it's no coincidence that this m movement is now spread around the world. It happened because of the sacrifice of men and women, the willing sacrifice of men and women who gave their lives to God, who put themselves into the hands of the Holy Spirit and allowed him to transcend their weaknesses. As the Apostle Paul says, their weaknesses were made strength. Um, they wouldn't have claimed any glory or honor for what they did. And yet I think uh, as, a, as a later generation, we can go back and we can honor them. We can do them posthumous justice and acknowledge the contribution they made to building up this worldwide Seventh-day Adventist church. The podcast is is fantastic. I love being part of it. I love listening to it afterwards. But it's a little depressive in a way and also hopeful. The depressive part is that many of the stories we tell are people that dedicated their lives, sometimes got married just before going to the mission field. That's right. And when they got there, six months later, they're dead. Yes. Um, contracting a, a myriad of diseases in the tropics or, or otherwise. It was, it, it definitely took its toll on on their bodies, even those that stayed for a while and managed to to be there for longer periods of time. But it is a, what amazes me in, in almost every episode is their loved ones refuse to let the mission die. Yes. How, how can that faith be, be understood? That's a great question, and, I, and it's true. Uh, we can find almost no example of a family that said, um, we're very bitter about this, you know, we wish that our loved one, they, they, they do wish their loved one was still alive, but nobody who says, we're, you know, this, we regret that our family member went and served as a missionary. Um, in one case, uh, there's a missionary to China, a missionary couple, and while the husband is on uh, an, an extended itinerary into the hinterland of China, his wife and another missionary wife get murdered. 
Their children survive. They're, they're, they're murdered by a disgruntled servant. And he murders them in their bed. The two children who are nearby are, are, left, al- are left alone and survive. Um, and the response of the family of the murdered wife is to say, uh, we would come and serve if we could, but we're too elderly, but we have another daughter and she is willing to come and serve. So it's, it's the exact opposite of saying we regret that our, our, our loved ones went there. We regret that they died, but we don't regret that they went and served and that they took on this, this, this grave danger. Um, instead, it's just the opposite. There's a feeling that they've done something worthwhile and purposeful. Their concern is always that the work that their loved one has done doesn't go to waste, because perhaps that would make it a true tragedy. I think it's C.S. Lewis who said, uh, if an event is meaningless, then it's, a, by definition, it's a tragedy, that if it has meaning, then it's, it's, it's not tragic. Um, and so for them, if their loved one was to die without the work continuing, that would be meaningless, and it would be tragic. But if somebody else goes out and as they often, they often use a military analogy, raises the standard that they have fallen is the kind of language they use. If somebody else goes out and does that, then the death will have had been constructive. It will have been to some purpose. And so their faith, their faith, Sam, in the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist church is so profound that they are willing to endure the loss of loved ones, even though it's it's deeply distressing to them, and you can see that from the accounts that they write. But ultimately, what comes first is the mission God has entrusted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are people listening to, the, to, to this podcast and have not heard the other one yet. I'm hoping that they would. The, the link will be in the description on YouTube, and you can find it on AdventistReview.tv. But there will be people listening who are not Adventists. Maybe they have a family member who is an Adventist. They're interested in the Adventist church. And they're interested, obviously, in the history of how this Mm. movement got here. What would you say to them about the heritage of sacrifice that they would inherit if they joined the Adventist church? Because it would be easier to just offer them, you know, tremendous privileges and (laughs) your life will be better and all will go well with you. But they need to know in full transparency the truth that becoming a Seventh-day Adventist is to put the mission as a priority in your life. Those two things should be synonymous. They're not always, but they should be. They should be. How would you encourage them with the fact that they may have a whole lot of sacrifice to look forward to? Well, first, if you become a Seventh-day Adventist, we do believe it makes a, a positive difference in your life both through the relationship with Jesus that you enjoy and through the more healthful living that Adventists uh, teach and, uh, and, and desire that, it, that their members shall, shall emulate. Uh, but you're right. Uh, it, to be a Seventh-day Adventist should mean putting the mission first. Um, and I think there's a certain, there would be a certain mindset that would look at all these sacrifices and say, how appalling. Where was the duty of care of, of, of the church? But the people went into it with their eyes open because they themselves will have read obituaries or accounts of missionaries dying in the mission field. And yet there's never a shortage, Sam. There's never a shortage of people willing to go. There's always new volunteers ready to be sent. And that's the extraordinary thing. Even today with Vivid Faith, which is our platform for recruiting for recruiting missionaries volunteers and, and, missionaries, and others. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're told, and I don't have the numbers with me, but Sylvia, who is the, the manager of that, she all constantly has a problem of having too many people willing to go and not enough places to send them. That's right. That's right. And today, of course, it's not going to be, it's not likely to involve danger to your life, but it will involve sacrifice because even going a far away from your country is a sacrifice. Being far away from your family is a sacrifice. It may mean that your grandparents don't see grandchildren growing up and only see them once a year. Um, so there is a sacrifice to be made, but also even for those who are not called to be missionaries, which is the great overwhelming majority of Adventists, even in the past. Um, the great majority of Adventists never served as missionaries, but there was a sacrifice that they were called to, which was to support the mission through their offerings. 
And they did that. They did that to an extraordinary degree, which we've lost today, Sam. If you look at, uh, at mission offerings today, they have effectively plateaued since the early 1980s. But we know that a dollar today doesn't buy what it bought in the early 1980s. So, so they plateaued in terms of value, but if you account for inflation, it's actually dropped. Is that what you mean? Yes. In real terms, there's been a sizable mm. drop. And if you were to look at the percentage of tithe, which of course is a, t a tenth of the income, it's, it's difficult to account for inflation and also exchange rates. But if you look at the value of the mission offering in terms of a percentage of tithe, it's greatly dropped since it started in the 1920s. Um, we also used to have all kinds of offerings in addition to the 13th Sabbath mission offering, which Adventists always give on the 13th Sabbath of each quarter. Um, and some of those continue, but others of them have fallen by the wayside. So there's also a call to sacrifice. Uh, to sacrifice, if you can't go, you can pray. And pray, we believe that the, the prayers of a righteous man and woman availeth much, as the Bible says. And we've seen plenty of evidence for that indeed. Yes, but also there's a call to sacrifice your, 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 your funds to, to support the mission. And also it may be that you yourself will sacrifice, in a sense, a family member because you may not go, but they may go. And we, we want people to encourage family members to consider going, for example, as a student missionary or going as a, a, as a missionary or in being involved in service. Um, and even for those who remain in their homelands, there is a call to, to sacrifice time and energy to be involved in the mission of your church in the local area. What we as Adventists used to call 100 and 120 years ago home missionaries. But every ch local church has its own mission to its community, and that can only really be pushed forward if church members are willing to sacrifice time and energy to contribute to it. So you're right, to be an Adventist means putting the mission first, and it also means you are being called to a life of sacrifice. Some, for some, the sacrifice will be much greater than others, and it's still the case that missionaries occasionally die even today when they can be med evacked, you know, evacuated by plane and, and receive very good medical care very swiftly. Um, but the sacrifices will be greater for some than for others, but for all Seventh-day Adventists, we are called to make some kind of sacrifice. There is a, a deeply ingrained urgency in the mission of the Adventist Church that we need to proclaim what we call the three angels' messages. It's found in the book of Revelation chapter 14. These are like the, the last messages God has to deliver to people before the second coming, before he comes to renew all things. So this sense of urgency is very present still in many parts of the world, but other parts of the world seem to have lost some of that urgency. There is a, a new uh, project called Mission Refocus, which secretariat, you're part of the secretariat family, your department, um, that is encouraging Adventist entities to send missionaries to other parts of the world. So if you have a university, why doesn't the university send some missionaries to different parts of the world? Right. Um, tell me more about the, the project and especially the idea of having resources to invest locally in that given field, but as we say in Portuguese, taking your eyes off your belly button <laughs> and looking up to the world and, and investing in another part of the world by sending missionaries. So what the World Church did 150 years ago, how can entities, Adventist entities, do that the same on their own dime, sending people yeah. through? So there's two parts to it. One is for the, the World Church to refocus where it uses missionaries. Because to some extent, we're still using them in some of the same places we did in the 60s. Um, and those places are actually now thriving strongholds of Adventism. They're not needed so much there. They're needed in other places. So it's partly of saying, let's take the budgets that we've assigned for missionaries around the world and let's focus them where they'll do the most good. There's also a recognition that there is still a role for missionaries. Some had begun to doubt whether there was still a place for missionaries. But that's partly because they were being sent to places, again, that in the 60s were 
were weak, but now are strongholds of the church. And so it makes no sense to send missionaries there, but there are parts of the world where the church is very weak in terms of numbers and of finances and resources, just weak all around. And they need missionaries. They need missionaries to come in because they don't have the resources to evangelize their own territory. But the second part of missionary focus is precisely to encourage all Adventist entities to look outside themselves. And after all, isn't that a principle of Christianity? I like your Portuguese uh, metaphor, proverb, um, but really Christ calls us to look beyond ourselves. If we're only looking at ourselves, we are doing something profoundly unchristian. Hmm. And so for those who say, I'm not going to care about the rest of the world. I only want to focus on the mission here. Well, in a sense, that's laudable because we do, wherever here may be, we do need to focus on mission there. But there is a calling for us all to look beyond ourselves. And so the idea is that even those areas that, um, that receive missionaries themselves will send missionaries other places because it focuses them outwards. It focuses them even more on the mission. And those people will go and will be enthusiastic and will come back and tell stories and inspire the people around them. So that's mission refocus, to try and have every Adventist entity sending missionaries, not just the ones the General Conference says that are sent through a somewhat bureaucratic and slow process, but local unions and conferences can send their own missionaries, um, which will, again, inspire the people, but also do a power of good. And above all, they were, we will be focusing outwards as Jesus wanted us to do. David, thank you very much for talking to us about mission and these stories. My pleasure. If you've been listening to this and you want to hear those stories, then go to AdventistReview.tv and look for Mission 150. If you want to become a missionary, even short term, even closer to your home, just go to VividFaith.com. Now, there are many things more that we can talk about mission. And in the next episode, David will come back and we will discuss the other elements of mission, even statistics and research. We'll see you in the next episode.